Hey, hey, we're saints. Good morning. God bless and keep all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One God, amen. There were three vampire brothers, three brothers, and they were vampires. And they decided, we're going to sh- decide who the, has the most power, who's the best vampire. And the oldest brother says, I'm the most powerful. I'm the best vampire. And he, he runs away at 100 miles an hour. Two minutes later, he comes back. He's blood all over him. He says, you see that house up there? There's a family there. I took care of all of it. I'm the most powerful. The, the next brother, he says, you know what? I'm the most powerful. And he runs away at 150 miles an hour. Three minutes later, he comes back. He says, you remember that, that town, that village over there? No one's left. He has blood all over his face. The youngest brother, the third one, says, you know what, guys? I'm the most powerful. And he runs away at 200 miles an hour. Within like 10 seconds, he comes back all over him, blood everywhere. He says to his brothers, did you see that tree? They said, yeah. I didn't. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> you get it? Like he said, do we have to, like, he ran, he didn't see it. Face first, nothing? All right, you guys got to work with me. All right. We're, I wanted to talk about, you know, power and being the best and who's the authority in our life. Um, I've been reading scripture voraciously, as I always do, but I'm starting to see things in a new light differently as we begin with the beginning, right? So we know that God creates everything in Genesis. In chapter 1, he creates the heavens, the earth, all of the things in the earth. And each day it's good. Until the last day, God creates everything. He looks at everything and he says it is very good, right? This is to say that God, I mean, he's God. And whatever he creates is not just good, it is very good. The final uh, piece, if you will, of his creation was humankind, the man. And God gives the man the power to name all of the other creatures, all of the other beings, right? He says, whatever you call them, thus they shall be called. And so the man begins to name all the creatures. And then the text says something funny, but there was not a creature found fit to be the helper of the man. And as we traditionally think about this, we think, yeah, it's because man is, is somehow higher. He's better than all the rest of creation. And that, you know, these animals or whatever it may be, they're, they're just not good enough. And I started to question that because we just heard that everything God made was very good. Is it that there is no creation that God made that's good enough for the man? Or perhaps that the man in his hubris thought that there needed to be something different, something better. And so the story continues where God, you know the story, he puts the man to sleep and he, he takes a rib from him. In, in Hebrew it says, out from him, right? Now we often think of this, again, traditionally we think that, well, this is God bringing the perfect match of male and female together, right? Um, making a, a woman, right? So that it could be for procreation, marriage, and all that stuff. But I don't really think that that's what's going on either. The more I read it and the more I study it, I start to recognize he took out from him. And it wasn't creating a new thing. He made more of him. Listen, the very next verse, after he sees this creation that comes from him, he says, this at last is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she came out of man. And again, you think about it, you're like, you can hear it. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She's woman. No. This is bone of my bone, right? You hear it. Flesh of my flesh. He has taken out from him and created more of him. I kind of understand this as the creation or the birth of ego, of hubris. Now to show that, I, you know, to corroborate this, this reading that I've got going, the very next chapter, what happens with this new creation? The woman is in the garden and the devil comes to her and says... Tell us, is there any tree that you can't eat? And the woman says, yeah, we can eat any tree, but there's one in the midst that God said you can't eat of it for you will die. And listen what he says to her. But the serpent says to her, God knows you will not die. If you eat it, your eyes are opened. And listen to the kicker in verse 4. You will be like God. You see it. It's the temptation for her, this, this hubris that came out from man that was man that was made more man, wants to be powerful, wants to be like God, right? And as we know, because of this temptation, 
because they ate from the tree, they were cast out of the garden, and in their hubris, they died and returned to the ground from which they were taken. You see what's happening there. I don't know that it's about an actual guy, Adam, and an actual gal, Eve. I think the statement is to say that one route, if you will, of life, one choice that all of us have to make is in favor of self. The problem is that choice gets thrust out of the garden. Now, there's another option. There's another choice. It's definitely a much harder one, but perhaps in its difference, it's victorious, life-giving. In Mark chapter 8, we just heard Father Paul read for us. Jesus is on the way, in Greek it's entiodo, he's on the way to Jerusalem. And he heals people along the way. And at one point, he asks his disciples, all right, what's going on out there? Who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street about me? And his disciples tell him, you know, some think you're a prophet and some say Elijah and John the Baptist. And then he asks them directly, who do you say that I am? You're my closest pals, right? You've been following me since the beginning. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, right? The anointed one, the one who God sent to save his people. Peter makes the right declaration, right? He witnesses that Jesus is indeed Lord, which is awesome because Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. But then it's not awesome because Jesus says, you're right, Peter, but look, the Son of Man is going up into Jerusalem and he will be betrayed by the elders and the scribes. And they're going to mock him and scourge him and spit upon him and they will put him to death. And then three days later, he will rise, right? So he's declared, he, Peter, has declared Jesus as the Son of God. I mean, ultimate, ultimate power and authority, if you will. But then Jesus turns around and says, yeah, but I'm going to die. And Peter gets irritable, and he rebukes the Lord. I mean, who in your right mind, right? You just declared the guy the son of God, and now you're going to rebuke him. But you could understand why Peter would have done that, right? Like, no, Lord, you're powerful. You're, you're earthly authority and kingship. I mean, it's, it's, it, you're going to go in there with the sword, and you're going to conquer the Romans. And you're, you're going you're gonna to get rid of the Pharisees and scatter all the Jews who are against you. You're going to rule. You're going to be a good king, but you're going to be powerful and a good king. This whole thing about the cross, no, Lord. And then listen to what Jesus does. I mean, you can see what's happening there, right? I mean, he's offering Jesus power. Maybe just like Satan offered the woman power to be like God. And Jesus says to him, listen, it's so rough. Get behind me, Satan. And not just because, you know, he didn't like Peter. Because Peter was not on the side of God, but he was on the side of men. You see it. Like, the devil tempted the woman in the garden, and they both ate because they were looking for hubris to build up themselves. Jesus, who is the source of all power in the first place, says it's not about that. It's about going to the cross. That's where might actually lies. That's where victory actually lies. That's where victory over death actually lies. And he calls Peter, Peter Satan, Peter, he calls Peter Satan, get behind me, right? Because this is God's path, as bizarre as it may seem. And then he offers to all of us, he poses a question to us right this moment. He didn't write it, Mark didn't write it for us, he wrote it for those people, but I think it's applicable to us now. Do you want to follow the road that Adam took, or do you want to follow the way that Jesus Christ took? And he offers you this choice. If anyone, and this is the key, the kicker of the verse, verse 34 that we heard, if anyone would, would come with me, come after me, follow me, go where I go, be where I be, if anyone wants to be Christ-like, you have to deny yourself Take up your own cross and follow. That's a tough statement because, we, you know, I mean, deny yourself. What's going on here? I mean, we have to really think through how we deny ourselves. This, 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 um, the Greek words there, you know, for deny, it means like it's a repudiation. It's a repudiation. But I don't think it's that you deny yourself in the sense of I don't, I exist. Well, I'm going to deny my existence. Right? I don't even think it's really fully about denying yourself some of the pleasures of life. I mean, certainly that's part of it, right? Certainly that is, is I mean, why we fast in the Orthodox Church. Why we fast, you know, in Lent periods and before communion. I think it's that we deny your self. Follow it. It's not that we deny yourself, 
is that you deny your self. And I think the statement that all of this is telling us is that that challenge that we face, that temptation that we face almost on a date, well, on a daily, minutely basis, right, is to make myself like God. So that life is lived the way I want to live it. And that life and her rules, if you will, the, the, the modus operandi through which I live my life is written and designed by me. That's the challenge that we have to face. Because ultimately we know that Adam took that route and he ended up back in the ground. Jesus Christ took an entirely different route and though he goes to the tomb, he goes through the tomb. Follow that. It's a very different outcome. Adam goes to death, Jesus goes through death. It's a very different outcome. And the choice is put before us. We must deny our self that I am the Lord and master of the universe with all the power and the authority. And remember that it is indeed God and his word that is unto life. Now, it's not easy, right? It's really hard. There are blockers all over the place. The one I, I picked for today is that beautiful, beautiful commercial from Burger King, right? You've seen the new ads. It's, it's you rule, right? BK, have it your way. You rule. Now, I use this one because it's, you know, they're the Burger King, and so a king rules. I get the, the metaphor that they're doing, but it's kind of indicative of, of the messaging of all societies thrown at us, that you rule, you decide, you are king, you are queen, whatever it may be, and that your way is the only way. Problem with that, like Adam, if that's how you think, there's room here for your way, maybe taking from your own rib, but there's no room left for God. That makes sense. You follow all that. The challenge for us is not to, not to take the bait of the society to always think that I rule. To do that, I'm going to end here. I'll be brief. It's, it's, it's so hard. It's so difficult to do. But we have to remind, excuse me, remind ourselves each and every day, each and every day, that God is the Lord. Okay? That's, that's a powerful statement. We even sing that hymn in Orthros. God is the Lord. Allahu Rabbu Dhaharalana, right? Theos Kyrios, right? I mean, God is the Lord. Now, this word Lord, it's not something that we want to take lightly. It actually means master, right? In the sense of a master and slaves. And so, if he is the Lord, the master, what does that mean that we are, right? Like in English, because we've had a, a history, we use the word servant, right? That's not really the word. Bil Arabi Abdullah, right? The slave of God. And the same in Greek, they say Dulos or Dhuli to Theu, right? It means a slave. He's the boss. He's the Lord. He's not our buddy. He's not our friend. We don't hang out. We don't play baseball together. We're not walking on the beach with a bunch of sets of footprints and then there's one. He's the Lord. He is the Lord. And his word is ultimately for us law. But the beautiful part about that is that if we listen to his voice and heed the commandments of God, it leads just like him through the tomb into eternal life. Remember, he said it. If you want to come with me, you have to take up your own cross and follow. Every day, brothers and sisters, I need you to think. At least you say it to yourself in the morning three times when you get out of bed, look in the mirror as you're brushing your teeth and say, God is the Lord. God is the Lord. God is the Lord. And today, I will do my best to heed the commandments from his voice. I promise you this. Here's the funniest thing. This is my last statement. It's really weird if you think about it. The cross is bizarre because it's, it's designed for death. And here we are talking about life, right? And that the cross gives life. We even call the cross precious and life-giving. It's kind of weird. It's an oxymoron. It would seem that Adam's way would be the right way. Take care of number one. You rule, right? It would seem that that's the right way to do things. And yet, we all know it doesn't work. And interestingly enough, there was only one way that crushed death. Only one way that went to that empty tomb. There's only one way. It is the way of the cross. What shouldn't work is indeed the only thing that does work. And I promise you this. I know you're going to laugh at me because it's like, I, the more I think about it, I, I kind of laugh at myself. It's like, oh, Jesus was right. He wasn't fooling around. <laughs> like, yeah, of course he's right. But when you live the crucifixional life, it works. It's not perfect. Nobody's life is perfect. 
but the crucifixional life actually works. It does what God says it will do, giving us life here and ultimately in the life which is to come. May our great God and Savior Jesus Christ and his way and his word fill your hearts and your minds.